Namaskar. Today is May 20th, 2021 and welcome to Daily Global Insights with Sri and Sri. This is episode number 167. Here are the top 20 stories making the global headlines. In US news, BLM stands in solidarity with Palestinians, vows to fight for Palestinian liberation. Sridharji, this is confusing the thing a little bit. You know, I don't think Israelis are fighting the Palestinians per se. And, and BLM is being, being very clever or cute with their wording. What are your thoughts, sir? I think that two things come out. One is BLM is an extended political organization. Uh, it is not some mumbo jumbo stuff as Biden tries to fool us. Uh, and they are the extended progressive, extended progressive group political wing, uh, which conducts agitations in the United States. That's number one. The second thing that comes out is that you can see within, you know, the who are the people, Ilman, Ilhan, uh, Talaib, Rashida Talaib, etc., or the advocates of this. So what you are hearing, hearing is the political statement which those people make is what is heard, uh, or even by including Bernie Sanders, is what you are hearing from BLM. So therefore, as you correctly point out, now BLM is talking about Palestinian, whereas the Israel is fighting Hamas, which is firing rockets from Gaza. There's no mention of Hamas and rockets in the statement of BLM. And, and Biden urged to reinstate Keystone by 15, I'm sorry, Biden urged to reinstate Keystone by 19 GOP attorneys general. This is something that is again gathering steam. And uh, we saw in the case of the pipeline, uh, some other things. Why is this government bent upon stopping Keystone, sir? Um, is this something that can be turned back on at a short notice? Uh, it is. Uh, we, 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 it's very simple. What it is, namely, the progressive have uh, have an agenda. Uh, they're more agenda driven rather than economics driven. Uh, the fact that you have an existing uh, pipeline and you also have ability to extend it, the fact that is that will service. Uh, the needs of the country and make it self-sufficient and also net exporter, you are finding that being blocked by these activist groups or progressive groups. This crisis that was inflicted on the United States proved the point that unless you have an alternate plan, well-established, well-oiled and in motion, don't stop and don't expand what is current. You can reduce the scope of the expansion, but you do not want to cut down what you have. And um, what is the status on the pipelines? Are? Has the pipeline resumed 100% production? Yes, 100%. And in GOP, governors reject federal boost in jobless benefits and on the contrary offer back to work bonuses. Biden relief package also reaches Japan. Wow. So somebody in Japan got the, uh, the stimulus check? Yes, they did. Um, <laughs> and um, he, 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 is, he, is, he is the story, right? One is most of the governments around the world are utterly incompetent. And when they get enthusiastic, their incompetence level even goes further. Um, these are people who are employed, who work in Japanese, from Americans, work in the United States pre-2005. They have all gone back. They are no longer residents of United States. Not necessarily they are non-citizens. They are not. So the, these benefits go to peace citizens who are in United States. This is not social security. This is the payouts of the relief program for here. So when they have looked at the database, they have picked up all these people's names. System doesn't know. So they went through and said, let's kind of you know give it to everybody. So all these people, just as we had all dead people voting for Democratic Party. We have all people who are outside, who are, who are no longer residents. They all got checks. And, um, you know, it became fairly interesting in terms of banking those checks because, you know, Japan has its own uh, sets of rules and regulations. It doesn't mean it didn't go to Australia. It didn't mean it uh, didn't go to Europe. They all would have gone, you know, got it, banked it, and, you know, uh, very happy with it because this is, uh, thank uh, Mr. Biden, who is giving free money. And House Republicans offer a counter to Biden's budget that eliminates deficit in five years. Wow, that is a new. I mean, that's, that's a good thing to know. Sir, can you share some details on this uh, proposal of the House Republicans? 
the details are yet to be spelt out because they don't want to put it. But the basic structure of the plan is that ta Trump's tax cuts will not be abolished, that 1.5, 1.6 trillion uh, tax cuts will be retained. Um, this is on the individuals. Then the deficit, the, uh, the funding will be reduced and it will be capped around $800 billion. The minimum requirement in 568 to fund the infrastructure projects. And it will be funded with an alternate tax, but not by increasing taxes on business and individuals. And Nike, Coke, American Airlines are the target of ad campaign blasting woke politics. So all these are uh, related to Georgia, Atlanta. Is that what the relationship is, sir? The national. So because it's not like, you know, uh, American Airlines flies everywhere. So they have broadly taken a proactive approach with woke. I mean, Apple also has made its statement fairly clear. You know, to some extent, Amazon has made its statement very clear. But they are not big advertisers like Nike, Coke, American Airlines, etc. I'm not surprised Nike with its headquarters in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and so I think that the Coke is obviously headquartered in Atlanta. American Airlines is uh, surprise, surprise, it's headquartered in uh, Dallas. But the story is that uh, the fact is that uh, this, this thing has come out. Anyway, the, uh, um, uh, it, so the ad campaign says, come mainstream, don't choose politics. I think that's the fundamental premise here. And Trump is back into U.S. politics and his rallies commence next month. Did he not already have one rally, sir, or it is it not true? Is had, but uh, he's relaunched his communication platform. Uh, there's also a famous uh, diagram, uh, the famous picture that he's putting up, which shows uh, Obama on one side with the gasoline prices at five dollars, and then you have uh, Trump uh, standing next uh, with a with a gasoline uh, price picture around two dollars thirty-five. Then he said. He shows his finger and says, do you remember? I'm not in office, so I want to get back. Uh, his finger points to that, uh, points to the uh, gasoline price, and that's very reflective of uh, the state of the market today. So he's saying, you know, you need me back because look at the price and look now, at other policies. I have that graphic up on the screen for our viewers benefit, sir. Now, there is a mischief here. Maybe it is unintended. But it is showing Biden, not, not Biden, but it's showing Obama. Uh, what happens is the Biden's policies are very reflective of Obama's policies. He's only 100 days in. So this has been his premise that what you are seeing is this, what the Republicans have called it is, this is Obama administration three, because it's expansion of Obamacare. It is renegotiating with Iran to get back the Iranian accord that was signed by Obama. It is about some of these things around the progressive politics of climate accord, United Nations, World Health Organization. So most of his policies is like reflection of Obama three. That's why they cleverly put Obama there, which is to say, Biden, you are not running the presidency. It's Obama running the presidency. That's why we are pointing that out. So now everybody is joining the chorus. It's not just Sri the Chityalaji and Sri Ayer. There are many people now questioning who really is running the government. So stay tuned. You will know more soon. Indian news. Israel supplies third consignment of oxygen concentrators, respirators to India. Israel has always been all weather friend of India, whether India likes to admit to it or not, isn't it? Uh, it is uh, it is very, very uh, uh, what I call um, disappointing that uh, notwithstanding the fact Israel is in the middle of a crisis in its own right and it's under attack, yet Israel has chosen to send all the supplies recognizing the challenges that India faces. If there's any evidence needed, that's a clear evidence that, it, as you rightly called it, Israel is an all-weather friend of India. And Chinese army has been deployed in large numbers along the Ladakh front. China also has upped its efforts to boost ground units in Xinjiang. So with your permission, I'm going to put up a, a map here of the Depsang Plains where there is a fair amount of buildup. Sir, it's up there now, so you can take it away. Well, I think there are two uh, uh, pieces of news. This one is from Gogra, uh, Depsang, um, then um, 
uh, they have not, and that Galwan, they have not uh, moved um, their positions, troop positions, and disengaged as they promised. We had reported again in uh, Daily Global Insights their reluctance after the 11th meeting to move beyond. Um, and they were insisting that they are not going to move beyond the, the Gogra region and vacate the Depsang plan, planes. They were not. Um, that negotiation continued. And so you see that what has happened is there are more buildup and more troops and more permanent structures. And the question is coming up, which is namely, is, the, is an eventual imminent attack um, in the, uh, because of the distractions that India is going through. They committed a mistake in the first in one year ago, assuming that India is unprepared and the tenacity with which Indian army defended itself notwithstanding the fact the infrastructure was only, you know, very modest relative to where it is today. So whether they're committing that mistake. The second buildup which we, which we reported is right up further north in Xinjiang, um, which they have not focused. They seem to have upgraded the military infrastructure and refreshed it. There was no military infrastructure. There was, but they have upgraded it. When you take a look at that particular region, it borders, you know, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and even Pakistan. So the question that's being asked is why they're doing that simultaneously, though it is not bordering with LAC. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, further uh, east of uh, Akshay Chin, uh, which is the line of actual control. So the question is being asked, so is there a dual front attack, one going towards Afghanistan because there are troops vacating? and in the process establish a Belt Road Initiative, which has been uh, lurking. They also want to have, have access to the Gadar port. Um, and uh, you remember that uh, we again uh, covered this very well. So when you put these two things together, there's growing concerns of whether there is an imminent attack when India is distracted. An Indian Navy, that is Coast Guard, rescues 317 people from barges and 390 are still stranded. This is uh, with respect to that cyclone, isn't it, sir? Yes, I think the, well, the point that we're trying to mention is that many a times India gets critiqued uh, that it is not thinking ahead. Um, so this, uh, this was put in place fairly well ahead of, of time in anticipation. Again, in DGI, we reported this news. Um, and uh, the fact is that the cyclone did come um, rescue efforts uh, did rescue. There was uh, the latest reports is that uh, some of the people who slipped and fell from these barges, there's been loss of lives as well, you know, close to a number of maybe even 100 people have lost their lives. That's the rough number. We can report it again tomorrow once we have more specific details. But clearly, uh, those relief uh, ships which were there uh, did do its job. And Indian uh, foreign yeah. exchange reserves are at 590 billion. And Indian COVID cases continue to slide as wave two battle continues. I'm putting up the chart for the same, sir. So you can talk about both these things. I have the chart up now. Hmm. Uh, so Indian reserves reach 590 billion. Um, it now is pretty close to, uh, it is now the fifth largest, if, I, if my memory serves me right, um, China, Japan, uh, Switzerland, uh, then you have um, uh, Russia and then you have India. Uh, the difference between Russia and uh, India is, you know, probably less than five, six billion dollars by way of reserves. Uh, so India is well on its way to be the fourth largest uh, by way of uh, reserves. The reserves are an important determinant um, in terms of its ability to meet its import requirements in the event of contingencies and exigencies. Uh, when it has no borrowing capacity, when it has no capacity to borrow to meet its import requirements, and in the last minute rush to various institutions to find capital, you would have seen in many instances, India takes its gold, pledges it, and tries to bring capital uh, when there is a foreign exchange crisis. 600 billion gives it the almighty power. Um, it's also a reflection of the strength of the economy. Why Switz Switz Switzerland is a reserve currency nation? So when I say reserve currency, reserve. Uh, savings nation. Um, it's the you know the two two financial institutions in uh, in, in Switzerland uh, represent the largest uh, you know private wealth held uh, anywhere in the world. Russia again because of the uh, the oil the energy. Uh, of course, China is because of exports, and Japan is again because of 
uh, the exports. So I think India, uh, the, the, that position reflects a very good strength. As far as the, uh, the COVID wave is concerned, let me also kind of uh, take a look at the numbers. Um, the net difference, the net difference, um, I think India is now, um, is around 100 and 150,000 people um, uh, relieved or cured or discharged uh, relative to what the numbers we had seen before. Uh, 382,000 uh, people, 380,000 people roughly um, uh, discharged on a daily basis was on May uh, 19th uh, to about 250 or 240,000 people uh, who were the new cases, um, which shows that uh, we already talked about the R factor across a few states. We covered UP uh, extensively in our uh, fireside session which clearly shows that uh, India is well on its way to managing the second wave, simultaneously putting the infrastructure, which also augurs well that the economy should begin to recover as India steps into um, the next quarter. And Israel uh, is pursuing a forceful yeah. deterrence against Hamas. I also read that, uh, uh, this is what Netanyahu is saying, and it bombs miles of Hamas terror tunnel. Uh, so presumably they had dug several tunnels. Um, Biden has also asked for a ceasefire now, isn't it? Biden is persuading and Netanyahu says uh, there's no way. There's no ceasefire. Uh, you know, we have a job to finish. Uh, our defense is our right. Um, and I think there's a tremendous amount of support, bipartisan support. There's a lot of Democrats who support Israel. Uh, and then, of course, the GOP support. So, therefore, there's broadly the, uh, uh, the support from those who have believed in the rights of the uh, Israeli state. There's always the left around the world, without any exception, whether it is India, whether it is Europe, whether it is parts, other parts of the world, which takes a different position. Uh, but Israel is very firm in terms of its pursuit. Uh, which is to say no rocket and no individual is going to threaten the state of Israel. And Putin says that Russia is ready to cooperate with all states based on equality and mutual respect. He's met and spoken with about 28 leaders uh, and he's basically telling them, I don't want to have war, you know, I want to be like a friendly, um, you know, um, so therefore if you treat me with respect, I'll treat you with respect. Um, this is just a statement coming out uh, as a counter to the rhetoric that uh, Biden administration has launched. Russia was uh, doing its own. Of course, it never stops itself from doing cyber attacks, surveillance, you know, all kinds of things as a nation that it, it does. I mean, you know, you go to other places, they'll say, U.S. is also doing something similar or China is doing something similar. Maybe India is doing something similar. So every nation is monitoring just as a self deterrence. Uh, so Russia is saying, you know, hey, no, I'm not trying to create any harm and, you know, therefore, you know, I'm minding my affairs. Now, whether that is the case or not, especially as it relates to Ukraine and Crimea region, that's a different discussion altogether. But this is meeting with people and saying, you know, I'm not uh, threatening the sovereignty of any of you. And U.S. warship sails through Taiwan Strait, prompting anger from Beijing. Well, they have been doing all the saber rattling. Now it is their turn to receive some, isn't it? Well, I think uh, the, um, the Taiwanese have made a statement which is to say, hey, you know, uh, we'll defend to every right. Always when you have this escalation of COVID, that's when you see that there is a closer attention being paid. We have reported Taiwan has seen little uptick in cases and they're trying to assess what they need to do. Um, and it's not clear as to what the origins were the people from across, you know, they, we also pointed out there's some few boats which came under uh, what you call as uh, refugees or uh, oppressed people trying to uh, escape mainland and landing in boats in Taiwan. Um, too suspicious, but the fact is that Taiwan, which was, uh, you know, which was uh, ranked as the nation which contained, uh, suddenly finds itself escalating cases and then it wants to, uh, you know, contemplate a a lockdown before these things gets out of control. Right around this time is when you have um, an attack that is pursued. Um, so United States is saying, okay, we are sending the ships to the Taiwanese Strait. We are keeping a close eye and we want to make sure that there is a deterrence and nothing kind of, um, you know, mischievous happens. And EU uh, agrees to ease travel restrictions on non-EU tourists 
Vietnam struggles to control COVID at industrial parks and so does ASEAN nations. And in, uh, in general, the world is sitting on the precipice of multiple crises former UN chief warns. So this is just essentially tensions all around the globe. Your thoughts, sir? Uh, I think he's pointing out uh, at least three specific issues. The first issue that he is pointing out is uh, this, this uh, COVID. And may, I mean, many nations don't have even vaccine and capabilities. And if it continues, that this could go completely out of control. I think the first thing, that's what he's pointing to. The second he's pointing to is that only, um, you know, one in eight, um, you know, 1.3 billion people still are not without um, access to clean water. Uh, their struggle. And then he gave another number, which is around people who have no access to water. One is clean water, one who has no access to water. And the third thing that he pointed out is that this um, climate, which is a big United Nations topic, um, the asymmetric nature of the climate caused by uh, emissions um, is causing problems um, in terms of ravages of flood and drought. Taiwan, for example, has drought. Um, right, they were suffering from the drought as well. So he is pointing to these three factors, these three uh, drivers: what accessibility to water, people's talk, climate, which is causing imbalance in the ecosystem, and the spread of the epidemic, where still the world is confronted with lack of facilities and vaccines. So he is saying that, and then of course the geopolitical tensions that is creeping in, be it on the Russian side, be it on the Iraqi side. Uh, be it on the uh, on the um, uh, uh, Israel uh, Palestinian side, they're all problems for uh, to be dealt with. And in markets news, Bitcoin tanks 20 percent in 24 hours to fall below 37,000, and Coinbase drops 6 percent. So, what is the reason for the steep fall, sir? The steep fall is caused by three factors. One is the mumbo jumbo about uh, the Tesla, uh, which is to say, I accept Bitcoins, I don't accept Bitcoins. Uh, then suddenly, uh, you know, Elon Musk saying, hey, you know, um, I'm not going to sell. I never said I'm going to sell my Bitcoins. You know, that's one factor. Uh, the second factor that is, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, causing this uh, consternation amongst the people is suddenly China saying, oh, we're not going to allow Bitcoins. Now, the markets are reading it quite differently. We have covered this quite well, which is to say, China doesn't want a Bitcoin. China wants a China-based Bitcoin. It's even pushing the Japanese, the Koreans, and even the Southeast Asian nations to absorb something that is linked not to US dollar, but to, uh, to Yuan or Renminbi, as you want to call it, so to the Chinese Yuan. So you have the Chinese statements that it will put regulatory clamps on the Bitcoin. So that's the second. Third, there's always been some, uh, you know, regulatory uh, pressures around the world. Like, for example, India, uh, to some extent, you know, you have had inconsistent statements even in United States and then Bank of England. So that's the second. The third is that there is this uh, institutional investors. There is what you call as people who take contrapositions uh, and saying, oh, money is flying from Bitcoin to gold. Institutional investors are shedding um, Bitcoin and moving to things. So which cost? It went down to 32,000. It picked back up to about 35. It finished the day at 39,768 um, yesterday. And, um, you know, it still is a little bit moving up. Um, so I have a feeling that this will eventually settle down uh, and, uh, you know, um, and, and make its way. It just crossed yesterday. We reported $2 trillion, day before yesterday, $2 trillion. Uh, but in market cap. Coinbase had a fallout uh, with the volume of trading um, and, um, and because of the Bitcoin, the correlation in terms of its uh, volumes and performance. Uh, so it took some hit. So we started around 3.30. We are around uh, 226, 230. Uh, if you are still a believer, then you're making 100 bucks a share if you choose to uh, be, a, you know, what you call with a man with uh, uh, a great heart to withstand the, uh, the tensions as we go through in the next 12 months. What can I say, sir? You are a man with a golden coin. Indeed. As inflation fears gather, the 10-year Treasury rate now climbs to 1.6%. Um, 
this will that mean that the mortgage rates will also start slowly going back up just to tame inflation it's gone up to 1.683% okay we we're getting close to the 2% which we, we which we had predicted would happen before the end of the year one of the questions that was asked by one of our people one of our um, um what you call followers is that you know when would we see two percent i think you know we said that it would be before the end of the year so we are very striking distance like biden administration we have so many inconsistencies that come out and every day there's an inconsistency there's one more inconsistency that came yesterday if the economy begins to show steam and picks up momentum we will reconsider our monetary policy in simple terms if they can the rates we are willing to change the rates if we believe that is what is needed to contain inflation so that's a very big statement from the uh, the treasury a very big statement from the fed and uh, to some extent from the treasury so the gyrations in the market is what you are seeing caused by all these upheavals and with that we bring our today's episode to a close do join or subscribe to our channel join us as a member and share our links with your friends and families and with this we bid you adieu and tomorrow we'll be back bright and early sridhar ji namaskar and thank you very much and we'll be back tomorrow namaskar and thank you so much have a wonderful day or have a wonderful evening depending on where you are